Well, hey everybody, what's up? Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to talk about a very controversial topic, perhaps one you've given a lot of thought about, perhaps not. We're talking today about images and icons, and in particular, whether it's appropriate for Christians to use uh, to have images of Christ or any of the three persons of the Trinity in their home, in their discipleship resources, hanging from their refrigerator, uh, pictures of Jesus in your wallet, all of those kinds of questions today. I do have to tell you, quite honestly, that my own view has changed quite a bit on this topic. Um, I can remember as a kid growing up in the Lutheran church, we had stained glass windows everywhere, including of Jesus and the uh, saints and statues of the apostles. We had that uh, very famous picture of Jesus in the hallway going up to the sanctuary in the Lutheran church, that famous a uh, long-haired surfer Jesus, tanned skin, looked like a California summer surf boy kind of a picture. I had that in my wallet for a long time, but I have to tell you my view on images of Christ has changed dramatically in recent years. In fact, uh, let me tell you just a little bit of personal history here. When I was first ordained as a Presbyterian minister, I actually took Larger Catechism 109 as an exception during my ordination process. Now, if you're not familiar with this, you can actually scruple something that's in the confession or the catechisms, as long as you make it clear to your presbytery in writing where it is that you disagree from the confession and why. And I actually took one of my few scruples from Larger Catechism 109, because as we're gonna see in just a moment, it actually forbids the making or usage of any image of the three persons of the Trinity. And so I wrote out in my exception, why I thought that might not should be the case for a Jesus in particular who is the incarnate word and my presbytery at that time accepted that as an exception. Since that time I removed all of my exceptions and when I transferred into the PCA to my new uh, presbytery here at Ascension I came in with no exceptions to the confessions and so my own view and practice has changed about this um, over time. In fact I've gone from thinking it's totally acceptable to having images of Christ to the position that I'm going to argue for in this video, which is that it's not appropriate or acceptable to use images of the Trinity in our teaching or in our worship resources or even as decorations in our home. Now, I realize that that strikes many of you as strange and offensive. Uh, perhaps that's not the position that you or your church hold. Certainly, it's not the majority position of the evangelical world today. But what I want to argue in this video is that it was at one time the majority position of the Reformed Church in general. So. I've come a long way on this topic. I don't expect everybody to be where I am on this topic, but one of the reasons that I'm going to hold the line is because I don't want to be the generation that uh, compromises. And if this is the traditional Protestant Reformed position, indeed, if this is the position from Scripture, then it's certainly the position that I want to defend. And so uh, we're going to talk about that in this video. Um, I will say this. This is a, a little bit more comedic, perhaps. I was serving in a church which had stained glass windows of Jesus all over the sanctuary. This is even more recently not here at Gospel Fellowship, thank goodness. Uh, but me and one of my colleagues, we used to joke that we renamed all of, <laughs> all of the stained glass windows so that they weren't referring to Christ, that they were referring to some other scene. Uh, for instance, uh, the scene of the uh, shepherd, which images Jesus as a shepherd. We talked about that as the stained glass image of David the shepherd uh, for the one where Jesus is being baptized we we used to tease that that was the uh, the cleansing of Naaman and so we had all of these variant titles for uh, for the stained glass windows and we used to kid a little bit about that but it's a serious topic and so I thought I'd tackle it today as part of the reformed view series now if you're just joining us in this series of videos, I've got a whole playlist on this. We're taking on topics that are kind of peculiar to the Reformed faith. And my hope here, here is that those who are a newly initiated into Presbyterian world, <laughs> you'll have some idea of why we're so weird. And for those of you who are not Presbyterians or Reformed, you'll kind of understand us a little bit better. So in this series, I've taken a look at our views on baptism, the Lord's Supper, the regulative principle, original sin, uh, why we don't have female pastors, a couple of videos on our views of the end times, uh, speaking in tongues, the covenants, the freedom of the will, and you can find all of that on the playlist entitled the Reformed View series. Now, for those of you who are new to this channel, thank you so much for joining me today. You're in for a good one. I hope at least uh, maybe you'll disagree with me. I might get some thumbs down on this video. The last time I talked about images or icons, I got a lot of thumbs down from those of you Lutherans, Anglicans, Catholics, and uh, Evangelifish out there. 
who don't have refined views on this issue, but maybe today, hey, maybe you may learn something. Maybe you'll maybe you'll learn uh, at least why we draw the lines where we draw them. Well, again, my name is Matthew Everhart. I'm the pastor of Gospel Fellowship PCA. Thank you so much for joining this channel. You can, of course, subscribe and like if you do that kind of thing. If not, no big deal. I never pressure people about that kind of thing. I do want to mention, though, that if you're anywhere in the area, I'm going to be doing a couple of talks on critical race theory on Wednesday night, June 9th. A couple of lectures. Love to have you for that. Uh, by the way, this is 2021, so June 9th is no longer a relevant date. Just forget I said that. Um, I do have a Telegram channel. I'll link that in the description below if you like to follow me on a regular basis, a daily basis, uh, photos and short thoughts, things like that. Uh, Twitter as well. And don't forget also 2021, our conference, our theology conference in November, November 12 and 13, we'll be having a theology conference here at Gospel Fellowship PCA. So uh, please join us for that. And of course, uh, go subscribe to the Gospel, Gospel Fellowship YouTube channel and our podcast. You can keep up on all of these things. All right. So here's our approach in this video as we tackle the topic of images and icons, especially those related to the persons of the Trinity and in particular to Christ. Uh, first of all, we're going to look at some scriptures that I think uh, should speak the parameters of the conversation to us. Uh, second of all, we'll look at the Reformed Confessions. Now, a couple of you who've seen the Reformed View series have actually complained in the comments that I say too much about the Confessions uh, as over against just the Scriptures. Well, I would simply say this, while we do hold sola scriptura, that Scripture is the ultimate authority, as confessional, orthodox, historic Protestants, we do have our, uh, our sub-authorities, our confessions and catechisms and creeds. We do not hold these on the same level as Scripture, but we do think, them, think of them as having uh, helpful guidance to our lives. And in fact, when we're ordained, we promise that we believe these things, so we're not lying to the churches that are calling us. Uh, we call these our subordinate standards. And so, yes, I'm going to quote the uh, the confessions today. So if you're not into that, we'll skip over that part. Um, but if you are, at least you'll understand a little bit of what some of the historic reformers were thinking when they worked through the same issues that we're working through today. One of the problems with evangelifishism is that it sort of thinks it's working through these issues for the first time in history, where in reality, no, Christians have thoughtfully dealt with these issues many times in the past, including the very discussion we're having today about images and icons, especially images related to the persons of the Trinity. So we're not forging new ground here, and it's helpful then for us to look back at what other Christians have said. Okay, so first we'll go to Scripture, second to the Reformed Confessions, third we'll talk about modern usage, and then I'll probably wrap up with some q and A. I'll ask myself questions and answer them. Uh, since you're not here with me to, to join me for this. All right, so let's get into some of the scriptures here. The first place we should probably look at is the Ten Commandments themselves. Uh, the Ten Commandments do have a commandment related to the use of visual imagery. And what we find in the Second Commandment, of course, is that uh, they're forbidden. Surprise, surprise. So look at Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 through 6. It says this, quoting, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that's in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to the thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So we actually have a commandment on this. Um, so we who are Reformed, we would say this is not a peripheral moral issue. Uh, this is not a matter in which uh, everybody's opinion just is kind of uh, an equal starting place. This is not an issue of adiaphora. Theologically, we have the term adiaphora, which is to say those, those peripheral issues that are so far away from the center of Christianity that um, it, it's hard to even find what it is that the scripture speaks authoritatively about these matters. But no, um, we actually have a commandment about the use of visual imagery and pertinence to our worship. And the commandment is one of forbiddance. Uh, we're not to use these kinds of things in our worship. So this is not just a peripheral issue to Christians, but it is in fact a central issue. And uh, that commandment, the second commandment, of course, is in both the Exodus version as well as the Deuteronomic version in Deuteronomy chapter 5. But even prior to Deuteronomy chapter 5, we have another text that speaks to the issue. Deuteronomy 4 
verses 15 to 19 gives us a little bit of background. Now remember in Deuteronomy chapter four precedes chapter five, duh. Uh, but this is going to help explain the second commandment in Deuteronomy chapter five. And so Deuteronomy 4.15 says, therefore watch yourselves very carefully. So again, this is an issue of some warning to believers. Since you saw no form on the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire, Beware, lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourself in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of any fish that is in the water under the earth. Okay, so you saw no form on the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb. And now, of course, this is, uh, this is referring to God speaking to his people on that, gra that great Mount Sinai encounter. Sometimes Horeb is also called Sinai, variously so called. And God did not manifest himself in any particular shape or color or image. And so the point here then is that we should not try to recapture what God looks like by making an image of him. He is one who cannot be imaged in this way. Now, of course, we have the image of God within us, but that speaks uh, more to who we are as humankind, our reasonable soul, uh, the fact that we have a capacity for relationship with God, for holiness, for righteousness, etc. But as far as what God looks like, Deuteronomy chapter 4 says he doesn't reveal that to us, and so therefore we should not try to paint him or carve him or etch him or anything like that. And this is the same language that Paul picks up in Romans chapter one. Paul says, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. Notice that exchanging of his true glory, his manifest holiness, his wonder, splendor, love, majesty, etc. Exchange it for what? For images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Now that speaks um, to mankind's propensity to perpetually try to worship things. Uh, mankind does always want to try to have a statue or an image or an icon for use in worship. Sometimes to worship the real God using them and sometimes to worship the fake gods or the false gods also using these these uh, images or, or uh, objects that are supposed to in some way convey the majesty of the God or the gods to the people. And Paul says, no, that's futile thinking. Do not do that. Now, when Paul preaches his sermon at Athens at the Areopagus in Acts chapter 17, he says something that, like this. Being then God's offspring, we are not, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art or the imagination of man. So there's no sense in which any artwork, no matter how skilled, Okay, so even if you're Michelangelo, even if you're Donatello, uh, even if you're Leonardo da Vinci himself, you are not skilled enough to draw, paint, carve, um, or erect something that equals to the beauty of God. And so no matter what you do, no matter how hard you try, no matter how skilled you are, no matter how imaginative you are, you cannot capture what it is in the divine essence so as to create something with the hands by which we can either worship him or worship through it to him. That, according to the scriptures of the Old and New Testament, is impossible. Now, if somebody asks me, well, does that then forbid any artwork? Uh, is there any sense in which we're allowed to have any artwork? Well, to that I would say yes. I mean, even the temple itself has some artwork in it. Of course, these are not objects of worship, but the temple was to be beautiful and typological to the heavens itself. And so in Second First Kings chapter 6, we see that as God is, is uh, giving um, the command for how the temple is to be designed, it says in First Kings chapter 6 that they are to cover the two doors with olive wood and with carvings of cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers, and that therefore he overlaid them with gold and spread gold on the cherubim and on the palm trees. Okay, so... It's not necessarily that uh, we can't do any artwork, 
Um, even some kinds of religious artwork may be permissible. But the point then to summarize all these passages is really three things. And let me just uh, summarize three bullet points for you. Number one, it seems clear then from the biblical data that no worship of other gods or deities um, can be aspired to using visual idols or images. In other words, the second commandment is very clear that we ought not to worship any other gods. That's the first commandment nor are we to worship those false gods or the real God by images or icons or the things of the art and imagination of man. Okay, so no worship of other gods. Secondly, no worshiping the true and living God by making images of him because he is impossible to depict. Any depiction that you make of God would necessarily and by definition be something that falls far, far short of who he is and what he is actually like. In other words, how can you capture what omnipotence is or omniscience or omnipresence in a piece of art? You can't do that. And since those attributes are intrinsic to the very nature of God, anything you would do to try to draw or sketch him or paint him or carve him or paper mache him or whatever other means you may have is going to fall far, far and woefully short of actually describing him in a way that is useful. And therefore, third, one of the things that seems apparent from all of these texts is that the use of images and icons and idols actually distinguishes false worship from the true worship because the true worship of the great and living God does not require or necessitate these sorts of things, uh, but in fact forbids them at practically every stop along the way. Now, somebody says, well, what about Jesus? Uh, isn't he different from the Father and from the Holy Spirit? Well, uh, to this we can at least say that the scripture does not directly um, address imaging Jesus through artwork, drawing, sketches, photography, whatever. Um, however, we've just heard a number of warnings that should give us great pause. And so before we just burst through that door of doing it because we want to do it or because we think it's a matter of Christian freedom, we should have a great amount of hesitancy to depict even Jesus, even the Son of God, because he is, in fact, the second person of the Trinity. So if the Father cannot be depicted and the Spirit cannot be depicted, then what makes us think that we should depict Jesus? And this is where I, first of all, wrote out that exception to the Westminster Larger 109, but later, under further reflection, I realized that the same principles hold true. Uh, because Jesus, although he is the incarnate second person of the Trinity, he was pre-existence in terms of his glory with the Father before the ages, right? So think of John 1.1, 1, 1. I think of John 17, the glory I had with you before the world was made, etc. And so even if we were to accurately draw what Jesus looked like, which by the way, nobody knows what he looked like, and there's no physical description of Jesus given in the Gospels, okay? Some things about Revelation, but he, in, in Revelation, but even those appear to be symbolic of his glory now that he's resurrected and ascended. Uh, it would necessarily then be a false or a woefully a short-sighted depiction of Jesus. And not only that, but we wouldn't be able to capture, even in the best, even if we had Leonardo, you know, <laughs> Da Vinci or DiCaprio, either one, uh, we couldn't capture such things as the hypostatic union between Jesus's humanity and his divine nature. So, uh, so extreme caution given the text from scripture, extreme caution given church history as a guide, which we're about to get into secondly, and then also because of the regulative principle of worship, which I talked about in another video, we should be very careful to do anything which isn't prescribed or commanded by God in scripture. So we can't presume the right to do what we want to do in worship just because we want to do these things. Okay, so that's basically the whole, the whole summary of the regulative principle. So let's get into some of the Reformed confessions on this matter. Uh, let's talk first of all about the catechism question, larger 109, which I originally took exception to, but then removed my exceptions um, while I was in the EPC and then had no exceptions coming into the PCA. Okay, so here's larger catechism 109. It directly speaks to the issue. Okay, larger 109. Question, what are the sins forbidden in the second commandment? Answer, 
So this is the Westminster Divine's explanation of the meaning of the second commandment from Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5. Here's the answer. The sins forbidden in the second commandment are all devising, counseling, commanding, using, and anywise approving any religious worship not instituted by God himself. Now, that so far is just a recitation of the regulative principle. Okay. And then it includes tolerating a false religion, the making, key language here, of any representation of God or any or all of the three persons of the Trinity, either inwardly in the mind or outwardly in any kind of image or likeness of any creature. Okay, so that about states it as expressly and plainly clear as possible. The Westminster divines forbid in their interpretation of the second commandment, any making of any images of any of the three persons of the Trinity, including Jesus Christ. It goes on. Whatsoever, all worshiping of it or God in it or by it, the making of any representation of feigned deities and all worship of them or service belonging to them, all superstitious devices corrupting the worship of God, adding to it or taking away from it, whether invented and taken up of ourselves or received from tradition from others. Now, some of you will say, okay, yes, but uh, stained glass windows and icons and images, like, look, um, we got that from our Lutheran tradition or our Anglican tradition or our Roman Catholic or our Eastern Orthodox tradition, but tradition itself is not authoritative enough to command us of what we should do in worship. But instead, the Westminster divines are saying we should only do those things that God expressly commands us to do. Now listen again to this language here. Though under the title of antiquity, whether they did it a long time ago, or custom, or devotion, or good intent. So even if your intention is to have that picture of Jesus to inspire you to think well of him, okay, doesn't matter what your intent is, says the confession, or any other pretense, no, it goes on that that is opposing the worship and ordinances that God has appointed. So that says it very, very strongly. Now, you may ask yourself, well, is the Westminster Confession alone in forbidding these things so plainly and clearly in such direct language? Answer to that, no. Um, the Heidelberg Catechism, which came before it, says this, question 90, 96, what does God require in the second commandment? Answer, that we in no wise represent God by images, nor worship him in or any other way than he has commanded in his word. Okay, so Heidelberg Catechism says, no, don't do it. Second question, this is question 97 in the Heidelberg. Are images then not at all to be made? Answer, God can, can nor may be represented by any means, but as to creatures, though they may be represented, yet God forbids to make or have any resemblance of them, either in order to worship them or to serve God by them. So there's not a law <laughs> that forbids you from painting a beautiful landscape or from taking photography of your children. We're allowed to have artwork of other things. The problem is when those things are used or incorporated into the setting of worship. Question num number 98. But may not images be tolerated in the churches as books to the laity? Now here, the catechism brings up an old argument, an old, old argument basically goes like this, and it's a carryover from Roman Catholic Catholicism and Eastern Orthodox traditions. Yeah, but you see, we need these images of Jesus because we teach them to those who cannot read or to those who are duller of mind. In fact, they would argue, we need these types of images and icons to actually inspire and to lift up the mind so that we may worship God aright. But the Heidelberg Catechism says no. Question 98, answer. No, for we must not pretend to be wiser than God, who will have his people taught not by dumb images, but by the lively preaching of his word. And I have to admit, I really love that phrase. Um, not by dumb images. In other words, images that can't speak. They can't say anything. They don't have preaching power. They don't have 
word of God expository power in them like the preaching of the word does. It's the preaching of the word that we are commanded to do in order to convey the truths of the law and the gospel. All right, here's another one. This is the second Helvetic or the Swiss Confession, chapter 4. I realize that probably none of your churches um, appeal to the Swiss Confessions anymore. The Helvetic Confession, maybe there's some churches or denominations out there that use that. Uh, this was written by Bullinger. Bullinger, remember, is the successor to Zwingli and a colleague of John Calvin. It says in chapter 4, related to images, Images of God. Since God as spirit is in essence invisible and immense, he cannot really be expressed by any art or image. For this reason, we have no fear pronouncing with scripture that image of God, images of God are mere lies. Therefore, we reject not only the idols of the Gentiles, but also the images of Christians. And then it says images of Christ. Although Christ assumed the human nature, yet he did not on that account assume it in order to provide a model for carvers and painters. Okay, so what you're seeing here as, as I'm building up um, data that shows that this is the historic orthodox doctrine of the Reformed Protestant tradition. Okay, so if you're an inheritor of the Reformed Protestant tradition, this is what we inherited from the Reformers. The answer is no, no images of Christ. What about Calvin? Well, I'm not going to quote from Calvin, but I am going to give you the citations because Calvin addresses this issue two times in the Institutes. In book one, chapter one, paragraphs one to 16. Okay, so one, one, one to 16. And then again in two, eight, 17 to 21. Uh, book two, Chapter 8, paragraph 17 to 21. That's his exposition of the Decalogue. So if you want to see what Calvin says on this matter, go look it up for yourself. But you can believe me when I tell you that Calvin's answer to this question is no, don't do it. In fact, Calvin even, um, he approaches that same question. Well, isn't it helpful in teaching material? Can't we use these sayings? If we promise not to worship them or to worship through them, can we use them for the sake of teaching? Calvin's answer, no. Don't do it. It's dangerous. Now, skipping ahead to modern reform thought. Well, unfortunately, today we live in a time and an era where Christians don't think reflectively on these things. Um, if, if many of my viewers are from evangelical, broadly speaking, uh, churches, I teased you earlier as though you're evangelifish, didn't mean to hurt anybody's feelings. I just mean by that those kinds of churches that don't think reflectively or confessionally or creedily on these matters that Christians have dealt with for years and for centuries, then you probably assume, uh, like you assume most things, that it's anything goes. It's like, it's, like the, it's like the book of Judges, man. Everybody did what was right in his own eyes. Well, maybe that's not the best perspective to take. Uh, maybe we should look back to the wisdom of scripture and church tradition. Um, in this case, however, we live in a culture, in a time, in a place, in a setting where um, everybody does what is right in his own mind. And he does what he, it's like an anything goes kind of a permissive attitude so that in the evangelical world today, uh, we have Christ very commonly depicted in film, uh, in movies, as well as in paintings, in statues, in ink, drawing, tattoos, cartoons, even comic books. And um, I'm sorry, but I'm not sure that any of that is wise, given what we've learned from Scripture and from the confession. So let's answer a couple of questions here, and then we're going to wrap up. Why is it then that if what I'm saying is right, uh, that, that God would forbid these things? Well, let me give you three answers. One I've already given. Um, two, I think, are implied in what I've already said. The first answer is, is because of his glory. Because of his glory, God does not see fit to try to be boxed or captured in ways that cannot contain the whole of his majesty. Okay? And so there's something about the use of images, icons, statues, Asherah poles, uh, depictions of Baal, um, images of surfer Jesus, whatever it is, that would fall short of his glory. And God does not like his glory to be diminished or to be besmirched in any possible way. So this is a glory issue for God. Now, this is an issue in which he considers his own worth and majesty um, as, riding up, um, as, uh, as pertinent to the question. 
okay? Second, we have a tendency towards idolatry that it just seemed to be part of who we are ever since the fall, okay? There's just a part of human nature that loves a good idol. And if you don't believe that, I mean, just look at Israel's history of flirting with idolatry. Think of Aaron. Think of the golden calf. You ask yourself, how could it possibly be that God would do something as glorious as deliver his people Israel out of slavery from the Egyptians, delivering them through the Red Sea by this incredible miracle in which they're delivered by mercy and the Egyptians are drowned in the sea. And yet the very next thing that they do is throw together all their jewelry and as according to Aaron, out popped this calf. Well, right. Uh, we know that that calf popped right out of the wicked heart that loves to see idols. Okay, And so because of God's glory and because of man's tendency towards idolatry, then the third point must be brought up, and that is that history shows that we cannot separate ourselves from worshiping in or through or to these things made by the hands of man. Um, no matter how hard we tell ourselves not to. And if you don't believe that, then what I would suggest is that you spend some time in a Roman Catholic church or an Eastern Orthodox church, church, especially in Latin or Central America or Mexico, where you will find that the actual worship and giving glory and honor and praising to and through and praying to these kinds of statues, unfortunately, has become part of the warp and woof of worship in these settings. It just seems to be so dangerous to the soul of man that it's better to not have them at all whatsoever than to put your own soul in the mortal danger of these things. And you say to yourself, well, what about teaching purposes? Okay, let me confess something to you. This is embarrassing, but I'm gonna confess something to you. Um, can we use these things to teach our children in, in our uh, Sunday school materials and other things like this? My answer to that, unfortunately, I know you're not going to like me for this. Hit thumbs down if you have to. But my answer is I don't think that's wise. And I'll tell you why. This is from my own testimony. Okay, Now, it's embarrassing to admit this, uh, but this is what happened to me. When I was a kid, before I was saved, I was seven, eight years old, something like this. Okay, And uh, we were driving through town, and it was Christmas season. And my mom pointed to a manger scene that was set up at another church in town. And she said to me as seven, eight, nine-year-old, something like this, look, there's where Jesus was born, okay? I pointed to the manger scene and said, there's where Jesus was born. I believed it. I believed it with all my heart. I believed that as a child that that was where Jesus was was born because my mom told me so and my mom was an authority okay she was an authority figure in my life and she was speaking metaphorically of course referring to the manger scene but I believed it to be literally true and so for the rest of that year and maybe two or three years following okay so I was old enough to understand I thought that that particular place was sacred and holy because Jesus was born there and it wasn't until I was saved several years later and had some greater comprehension of how the world works and how big planet Earth is and that Israel is over here and Bethlehem's on the other side of the planet. I did not understand that. And I was unfortunately deceived such that I believe that Jesus was born where he wasn't born. And if you tell people, whether it's children or people of a lesser intellect or the kids in your Sunday school class, that this is Jesus or this depicts Jesus or this image is Jesus in some way, when in fact it falls far, far short of his true glory and his majesty, then you may actually be teaching what is false. And that's the very thing that the reformers are so concerned to prevent us from doing. Okay, now... Second question then, are we therefore stripped of all visual means of teaching and instructing the true things of our holy faith by the use of what is visual? My answer to that is, surprisingly, uh, no, we're not. Why? Well, we, we don't have pictures and icons of God or the Trinity. We don't need them. But what God has given us in the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper is a visual display, not of himself or his glory, but they are depictions to us of the true beauty of the gospel. 
we have two dramatic events or scenes that we do in our church and you do in yours that in some ways point us to the glory of the gospel, though they are not intended to depict the three persons of the Trinity. Uh, they are the Lord's Supper and they are the baptism, the washing of the water with the baptism. These are enough for our, 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 excuse me, our eyes to see and for our ears to hear the preaching of the word. So, um, should we get rid of our Trinitarian pictures, portraits, images, sculptures, and statues? My answer to that would be, yeah, we probably should. Uh, thank you so much for watching this video. I do realize that uh, probably, probably many of you are going to disagree with what I had to say, but then again, maybe you learned something as well. Thank you so much for checking into this video. Do love you lots, and we'll talk to you later.